so today we are living in a coronized world or a covidized world but this corona virus is not more than 3 and a half or 4 months old and this covid disease is not more than 3 months old and a lot of relevance has been attached to immunity related to it so today what i'm going to discuss is give you some basics about corona which are new and novel and some basic guidelines on nutrition and covid which have just come out this is a pure educational talk for medical and other healthcare professionals who may be handling people related to covid and remember we are now in a era where we should do universal biosafety measures because a lot of people which we will see in practice may have covid and may be asymptomatic also remember that it is a live document because information related to covid changes every day so every second day you will have something new coming up on covid so what i may talk in a day might change tomorrow and i would urge you to go on the cdc who icmr and ministry of health website as well as your local state website the first message which i want to give you all is do not panic stay calm and behave responsibly because we are in a lockdown state but it doesn't mean that we need to panic it doesn't mean that we need to be misbehaving we need to behave responsibly and stay calm as i told you this corona virus looks like a football it's a beta corona rna virus and it has a lot of spikes on it as you can see in this diagram and we are learning more and more about it this corona virus was not known before 1930s and it was in 1930s that this corona viruses were discovered in animals the first human corona viruses were discovered in a lab called a cold human cold lab in actually uh, united kingdom and remember that is why it is a cold virus it is seen in cold season we all wish and pray that in the warm season or summers of india it disappears so we are going to study a little bit about how is the virus what is the virus how does it spread what is its contagiousness and are they how does it cause the covid disease and how de deleterious it is which are the vulnerable groups and can nutrition make an impact so you know there are two naming authorities in the world one is the world health organization and one is the international council for taxonomy of viruses so these microbiology groups identify the virus and who names the disease a typical example of that is hiv is the human immunodeficiency virus and the disease is called aids similarly the first corona virus epidemic came in 2002 when sars cov2 severe acute respiratory syndrome related corona virus caused sars then second epidemic of this came in saudi arabia and the middle eastern corona virus caused middle eastern respiratory syndrome and the third of that is sars cov2 which may get renamed now as hu cov which is human corona virus and it caused disease called covid 19 so that is the first name and the last name just like we have a name and surname it is basically sars cov2 and covid so if the name of the virus is sars cov2 or hu cov and the name of the surname is covid 19 so what is the history as i told you first epidemic came in 2002 from a bat it went to a palm cavity palm cavity is a, like a palm like cat so from see these corona viruses survive in the bats and it's a, basically these are bat viruses and from that it went into an intermediate host and from that intermediate homes called palm cavity it went to human beings it was the guang dong province in china and it then went to hong kong in a big way 8000 people were affected and it killed around 10% of cases but remember sars has gone from planet earth next in 2012 after a decade came the middle east respiratory syndrome corona virus it came from the dormandy camel via again a bat and went to the humans around 2500 patients were affected but it is it killed around 37% of people affected by it and last of it is just arrived from china from the hubei province of wuhan city which is the human corona sars cov2 which caused covid 19 and remember all these corona viruses infect humans they all have respiratory transmission making these pathogens of a pandemic potential 
SARS and MERS were epidemic, but WHO in March declared this as a pandemic because it has spread now to more than 212 countries. So fundamentally, the SARS, which came in 2002 in the Guangdong province, came from bats, spread to cavit cats, and from cavit cats, it went to human beings. Similarly, the MERS was coming from the bats to dormitory camels to human beings. And it was identified in South Africa. And now, of course, we have the COVID. This coronavirus, as I told you, is a simple beta coronavirus. It has a spike protein, which is critical for the host cell receptor to facilitate entries, mainly being the ACE2, angiotensin converting to enzyme. Then it has a nucleocapsid protein, which is bound to the RNA genome to make up the nucleocapsid. Then it has the E protein, the envelope protein, which interacts with the M protein. So when we are doing the blood test or this nasal or the oropharyngeal swab as a screening test, what we are identifying is the E genome or the envelope protein. And then we have the membrane protein, which is the central organizer of the cove assembly, determining the shape of the viral envelope. Some COVIDs do not need to have full assemble of the structural proteins. So you can have full virus or half virus. So basically, what are the viral factors? Now, viral factors which influence pathogenesis, it is fundamentally SARS-like COVID viruses have always existed in bats. From there, they can pick up a cavit like a cat or a mouse or a swine or a bat and bind through the ACE binding protein. But remember, the challenge is that it was probably, we don't know which is the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2, probably pangolins have been responsible. And these are the different proteins, the S protein. The S protein is the one which binds to the host receptor ACE2. And this S spike protein has two components, S1 component and S2 component. S1 is the one which determines the virus host range and cellular tropism by the RBD. And S2 mediates the virus cell membrane fusion by HR1 and HR2. So remember that the spikes go and lock their horns on the ACE2 receptor angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor and this ACE2 receptors are seen mainly in the ciliated respiratory epithelium, the pulmonary alveoli as well as the gut. And when they lock, they have two subunits, S1 and S2 and the S1 will cause the tropism while the S2 will you know, cause the fusion. And the fusion again has two pathways, HR1 pathway and HR2 pathway. That is for us to recognize. Now, everybody will not get a disease of COVID which is severe. Most of us might still get coronavirus and we wish and pray nobody gets it. But it will be a mild flu-like illness. It is only the vulnerable groups, which is senior citizens above 60 years or people with underlying disease like hypertension, COPD, diabetes, heart disease, they might get the severe complications like respiratory distress syndrome, the microvascular silent hypoxia, intractable metabolic acidosis, coagulation dysfunction, multiple organ failure, and so on and so forth. So how does this virus attach? You can see very nicely in this diagram that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein binds to the angiotensin converting enzyme. And with that, it takes over the pulmonary alveolar cell. It will then get an entry. The virus will enter. It will replicate and it will downregulate the ACE2 enzyme. Now, what does the ACE2 enzyme do? ACE2 enzyme is a counter regulator which actually deactivates angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7 which is an inactive form of angiotensin 2. So, what happens is if there is no ACE2 which is produced because the virus has taken over it, then there will be unopposed action of angiotensin 2. And that will lead to local activation inside the lung of excess angiotensin 2. And that excess angiotensin 2 will interact with the angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor. So there will be an explosion in the lung of a cytokine storm, which will cause acute lung injury, acute adverse myocardial remodeling and myocarditis, vasoconstriction and leaky capillaries. 
So remember, this is typically what is seen. And remember, if the angiotensin 2 is not produced, and when we give a ACE inhibitor or ARBs, they are not produced, then it could actually be counteractive and actually protective. It is called as paradox, the ACE2 paradox. So again, to repeat and summarize, the SARS-CoV-2 enters the cells after binding to the functional receptor on angiotensin converting 2 enzyme. After endocytosis of the viral complex, the surface ACE2 is downregulated, which results in the unopposed angiotensin 2 accumulation, which leads to a local activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which mediates the lung and myocardial injury, which causes death. So this caused a lot of fear in the world. And they said, should we use RAS agents, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor agents, European, American, International Society of Hypertension, Indian Society of Hypertension, Hypertension Society of India, API. We have all come with position statements that please do not stop ACE or ARBs if your patients are already on it. It might be actually protective. Let us go back to the virology. This is a new virus, but it has an 80% similarity to the SARS virus, which was seen in 2002. So there is a 80% structural homology between that old SARS-CoV-2 virus and this new virus. The closest relative of the SARS-CoV-2 with 96% homology is a bat virus, which was discovered in 2013. It is called RAT13, R-A-T-G-13, 2013. This is a virus found in bats and it has a 96% homology. And this viral strain is now, apart from the human viral strain, being researched on to find out whether it has any impact on the vaccine development. So we clearly know that this virus happened like an accident. It was a spillover event rather than coming from bat or an animal intermediate. And the spike protein attached to the ACE receptor, it went into the ciliated epithelial cells of the lungs and this tropism was seen in the virus. Today, it is spreading rapidly in human population. It has become pandemic. Clusters are being detected every day and infections are predominantly seen in healthcare workers. There is a R number in this virus. This R number is a reproductive number. Which means if one person gets a virus, how many people can they infect it? And that is called R0, reproductive number. That's the second thing which you should understand. The R0 of the virus means one person he gets that coronavirus will infect it to three people. Now, predominantly it is transmitted through respiratory droplets, micro droplets, or maybe even a fecal oral route. And remember, whether you are speaking, new research has shown through laser droplet particles, whether you are sneezing, coughing, you can get it. So it spreads mainly person to person through micro droplets, through closed contacts. And that is why physical distancing has been advised of two meters or six feet from a prolonged period of time and direct contact with COVID patients or their secretions had to be careful. Is it the most contagious virus on planet Earth? No. The reproductive number R0 is around three. Similar to Ebola and influenza, the HIV and SARS-CoV was a little more, maybe 3 to 5, and mumps, polio, smallpox was 5 to 7, and measles has the R0, or reproductive number of 12 to 18. Why are we all home? Because R0 for the disease, this is not the doubling time, is around 2 to 3. This And, of course, it can have spreaders and super spreaders. You know how it went from China to Korea to Singapore. From Singapore, it went to UK and Europe and France and Spain. And we know from a lot of Middle East or China, it also came to India. Is it the most deadly virus? Is it the fastest spreading virus? Answer to both the questions is no. Measles, chickenpox is faster. It spreads faster. This has a R0 of only 2 to 3 while measles has it of 18. Is it the most killing virus? No. Bird flu has mortality of 50%. MERS had a mortality of 37%. Spanish flu around 10% or 12%. SARS around again 10%. So this has a mortality of around 3%. Some parts of India are showing it around 5%. So maybe 5%, but not more than 10%. So what are the typical symptoms? 
fever in 99% of cases which is why they are using a thermal scan to cough which is dry dry and dry and shortness of breath and beyond that you can get difficulty in breathing muscle pain fatigue usually incubation period is 2 to 14 days but the incubation ke period can last up to 28 days so it is transmitted from person to person mainly by micro droplets in the respiratory tree occasionally by fecal route predominantly seen in the area and contacts and is diagnosed by a laboratory test who is at risk senior citizens in our population above 50 60 70 and 80 for every decade after 50 the mortality will go up and its risk will go up and if you have cardiovascular disease diabetes chronic respiratory disease hypertension cancer or any disease which will cause immunosuppression it will go up so that's something which we need to recognize and how does it start stage 1 early infections mild constitutional symptoms lymphopenia prothrombin time d dimer then stage 2 a as to stage 2 b and stage 3 is hyperinflammation so that is how typically it occurs so you will have an incubation period where it is seen in the nasopharynx where it is replicating and that is why they take a nasal swab and oropharyngeal swab and do an rt pcr test on it this is the time we isolate observe and do contact tracing next is the prodromal phase where you will get fever cough sore throat arthralgia myalgia diarrhea vomiting abdominal pain from day 1 to day 7 observe or sometimes we give hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine the main reason that is used is to prevent it from going into the pneumonia phase or the immunological failure then we can have pneumonia which again might need antiviral drugs or sometimes we might need something more than that like ARDS so typically the virus will enter into the lungs when it goes inside the lungs it will impair the neutrophil recruitment it will impair the interferon production by the nk cells it will impair the macrophage activity it will indirectly influence the dendritic cells the cd8 lymphocytes the antigen production and presentation will be impaired the cd4 lymphocytes will go down so the th1 cells and the th17 cells will be again impaired it will be a dysregulated immune response and it will it will lead to a cytokine storm so what will happen when the virus gets infected in the respiratory epithelium the ace expression gets over expressed there will be unregulated angiotensin 2 which will cause myocarditis renal injury and lung injury and multi organ failure will ensue so this will be like a immunological expl- exp- explosion and immune damage in the lung so nutrition is very critical eat well eat slowly eat on time eat right and have a complete balanced nutrition is the order of the day and what is more relevant today in corona times is nutritional immunology because never before has nutrition got so much of importance as in corona times and in nutritional immunology prevention of the disease is very well understood when you know the interaction between nutritional process and immune system we know our immune system in the young is very robust but when we actually grow old our immune surveillance comes down our resistance to infections comes down we get more malignancies we get more inflammation and autoimmune activation and as we eat less particularly when there is injury inflammation or recurrent illnesses there is a negative nitrogen balance muscle mass is lost and muscle fatigue sets in and therefore for covid now three major nutritional guidelines exist one is the european society for parental and enteral nutrition second is the american society for parental and enteral nutrition and from ground zero we have the chinese guidelines and we are coming out with the indian guidelines very simple european guidelines are check for malnutrition if there are older adults or polymorbid individuals ensure or if there are hospitalized people optimize their nutrition status so first is malnutrition second is optimized nutrition status third is supplement them with vitamins and minerals c with a d and all micronutrients so this is official guideline now regular physical activity oral nutritional supplements enteral nutrition in fact the buzzword in the icu is early enteral nutrition medical nutrition for non intubated patients medical nutrition for intubated patients medical nutrition for intubated patients who are sick and nutrition for icu patients who have dysphagia it's a 10 page 
10 point document if anybody wants it it's full text available free on the web or you can just contact for whoever got you this uh, web coverage and we'll be happy to provide you full text the american guidelines as pen are made with the society for critical care again supportive care is a cornerstone and nutrition is very important inside the icu as i told you they talk a lot about the early enteral nutrition early enteral nutrition is preferred over parental nutrition start slowly i have a small calorie deficit of 70 to 80 percent of calories but increase the proteins high standard protein with good quality in the early acute phase of critical illness will make a lot of difference chinese have the best they say that have a five step method diet nutrition education oral nutrition supplements tube feeding spn and tpn try to have around 20 to 30 kilo calories per kg body weight proteins around 1 to 2 grams have fats of medium chain and long chain fatty acids and then have the right fluids and micronutrients routinely they have recommended to supplement vitamins and minerals and immunonutrients pay attention to advantage and disadvantage and graphs to indications so that is something very very simple they say eat well but don't be overfull have a lot of protein rich foods like eggs milk fish beets beans nuts do regular fresh fruits and vegetables that's difficult foods rich in variety source and color no less than 20 kinds of food per day oral nutritional supplement might be recommended and has been recommended choose health foods like vitamins minerals fish oils probiotics prebiotics antioxidants immune enhancers they all are good chinese say the chinese guidelines says pay attention to personal hygiene wash your hands before and after meals do not eat in a work area eat without working clothes promotes meat alone pay attention to food safety very very important in this era is to pay attention to food safety avoid raw and cold food do not reheat food before eating increase drinking water up to 1.5 liters per day or more up to 3 to 4 liters except contraindications like cardiac and at least 7 hours of sleep it is very clearly documented the more you sleep the lesser are chances of your respiratory illnesses so balanced diet must include fruit and vegetables because they are excellent source of vitamins and minerals and they should be two thirds of the food we eat every day it is advised that we at least eat five portions of fruits and vegetables every day there is evidence to show that people who eat at least five portions of food uh, fruits and vegetables have lower risk of heart disease stroke and some cancers but very difficult in this corona era to get fresh fruits and vegetables because markets are closed what do all these compounds have they have beta carotenes which reduce crp and inflammation they have selenium which is antioxidant they have vitamin c and e which are very good antioxidants they have b complex vitamins which promote a lot of cellular energy gut and heart function they have folic acid which actually keeps down the heart healthy and rbc metabolism zinc which is very critical for prostate men's reproductive health immune system and normal vision and, and zinc has a lot of role today in the corona times magnesium promoting bone health arginine is very good also methionine is also very good and then we have some of these old herbs the roots now people thought ginseng is a chinese thing no it's a low doing shade loving perennial herb it belongs to a family called arsalania it has a latin name called panax ginseng and panax is derived from the greek word which is cure all so that is what it is there are different types of ginseng you have the korean ginseng and the american ginseng and we all know that the korean ginseng the panax ginseng is cultivated in the shade cloth in korea who has actually approved the panax ginseng from korea for medicinal use and we all know that the ginseng has the ginsenoids rg1 re ref rb1 rc rg2 rg b3 so on and so forth and they are all good for many things apart from immunity they improve cognition mental health memory vasodilator blood pressure and glycemic control the other ingredients for antioxidants are these chlorophyll derivatives or xanthophyll derivatives and carotenoids which are the pigment green algae these astaxanthin is a red pigment carotenoid which is seen in lot of living organisms and we know xanthophylls are yellow pigments which are having this carotenoids xanthus is yellow phyllos is leaf and you can see this is the yellow band seen on chromatography and these so called astaxanthin are red colored carotenoids 
in living organisms which are very useful they have very good effect on the immune system astaxanthin actually reduces inflammation you can see the nitric oxide going up going down prostaglandin e tnf alpha and il beta so clearly the inflammatory markers come down and then of course we have all the flavonoids which are very good for free radical and anti inflammatory effects apart from cardio gastroprotective effects and all these flavonoids have hesperidine as a flavon glycoside and this flavon hesperidin is bound to the disaccharide rutinase and we all know that this stimulates ghrelin and it makes you feel full it's appetite stimulant and it improves the endogenous antioxidants by increasing the local generation of catalyzed glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase in our population and reduces the pro inflammatory cytokines like tnf alpha and nitric oxide synthesis is improved so it is a very good anti inflammatory action and of course it has cardiovascular protection diabetic protection neuroprotection and it's a bioflavonoid so remember immune function to it is very important to enhance this and in the corona times the c d and the zinc have immunomodulating properties and a lot of these vitamins which we take and micronutrients which we take support the th1 cytokine mediated immune response and this is a very effective response for building our immunity so i don't think i want to bore you more i think i have told you the relevance of corona times we need to stay fit we need to eat well we need to have a complete balanced nutrition with vitamins and micronutrients but beyond that it is also important to have very good hand hygiene very good cough and spit and uh, uh, sneeze hygiene it's important that we maintain distancing and the most important thing is that every one of you can make a difference take a step back stay home and slow the spread so remember that in this corona times do not get into any coro psychosis or coro anxiety stay home stay safe stay clean and ensure that you protect your immunity but it is a smart virus so protecting immunity is one component we know that we already have taken bcg vaccine so compared to portugal which got less corona virus compared to spain portugal also got it but spain got much more so we may not get it like in america or europe but we will definitely get some corona virus we need to protect the reason we'll get it is because not because our immunity is weak our immunity is strong we have higher temperature but our challenge is we do not have a high hygiene quotient so improve your hygiene quotient and that's very important and with that if you have adequate nutrition you are building your innate immunity to fight this virus better so i really want to again reiterate to everybody that please do not panic we are locked in for a better india we are locked in for a stronger india we are locked in to be safer cleaner and happier thank you very much